Well, good. Well, I'm Stan Cunningham, and I've uh, been asked and I volunteer to do one of my favorite lectures, which is how animals adapt to the desert. Um, I taught animal physiology here for several years. Uh, I also studied animals in the desert for several years, so it, it's a real interest to me. Um, I'm going to apologize a little bit. My slides have a lot of text in it. Uh, I would rather have slides with lots of cool pictures, but since you guys don't have a textbook, I thought I'd better include information about what I'm talking about. So uh, I guess I have to be the entertainment um, and to put some boring slides. But hopefully you'll think the uh, information is cool enough that uh, you can stay, stay up with me. All right, well, let's first look at deserts. Um, and the uh, deserts are, occur on all the different continents. Um, they're found, and I'm going to try this pin here. This is new for me. Usually about 20 to 30 degrees from the equator uh, in distance. Uh, you can see our desert over here uh, is very equal to where the Sahara is even somewhat equal to the Gobi uh, in the same south of the equator. And the reason why is equator is, is the closest point of the Earth to the Sun. It gets more solar radiation. Uh, you don't wear uh, sunscreen in Hawaii. Even if you're a natural tanner, you might really burn because you're that much closer to the Sun. So when the Sun hits the Earth at that point, it causes, now we're going to go into Phoenix, uh, physics, it causes the air to rise because it heats up. As it heats up, it goes into the atmosphere and begins to cool down. Well, about the time that it cools down is about 20 to 30 degrees latitude, and it starts declining again in the atmosphere and going back down towards the Earth. But at that time, when air goes down in elevation, it heats up. So you have these hot areas somewhat equidistant from the equator, uh, and you've got these organisms that have to struggle uh, to survive in those areas. That's pretty much what uh, this slide pretty much goes over what I said. The way most people define a desert is it's less than 25 centimeters of precipitation a year, 10 inches of rain a year. However, there are some exceptions. For example, if an area gets 13 inches of rain a year, but it all is within two months, and then it's hot and arid for the rest of the period, that's still considered a desert. There's always going to be exceptions to any rule. Um, but generally, there are areas where uh, oftentimes that evapotranspiration and evaporation is greater uh, than the amount of precipitation. So it is a struggle. So animals, and I'm going to be concentrating on the animals, not so much the plants, um, have to deal with their endogenous heat load, meaning what we create interior, uh, and we've got a high metabolic rate. And, and so when I'm talking about endogenous heat load, I'm talking about mammals and birds. Um, reptiles, amphibians, they don't have to worry about it as much. Um, and you and I have to deal with it uh, if, if we're outside on an Arizona day. Uh, we're really going to be sweating. Um, some animals will decrease their metabolism. Uh, some will use evaporation like you and I do. Some animals will store the heat. They'll actually absorb it and allow their body temperature to rise. Uh, some will change behaviors between summer and winter. Uh, and then some animals are adapted either by being small or large. So let's go through all of those. Now here we've got uh, an ectotherm, so you've got a desert tortoise there. Um, and it's, it's absorbing heat from the sun. Uh, within that pretty busy slide there, there's some uh, ground temperatures that are 50 degrees centigrade, which is essentially lethal for almost all animals. That's not an uncommon temperature here in Arizona, especially uh, in the desert in the summertime. The ground temperature where you and I are, where our faces are, might only be 40 degrees centigrade, but the ground could be 60 or 70 degrees centigrade. Well, that's going to warm that animal up, and then it's absorbing radiation from the sun. 
Uh, in this particular example, the tortoise is using some water for evaporation. It's also moving down and it's getting into the shade. Uh, but what this slide just shows is that the amount of, of heat and heat transfer that's going on or any organism that's in a, a, a hot, arid area. Now, as I mentioned before, decreasing metabolism um, can reduce that, what we call endogenous heat load. And that would be like you and I just shutting down and, and running at about 50%. Um, we can't do that. Uh, our ancestors evolved in the tropics. It really wasn't a problem. Uh, even though it's hot there, there's plenty of water, we could still use sweat to keep cool. Uh, but arid adapted animals, uh, many of them have adapted uh, a reduced metabolism. And animals like Thompson's and, and Grant's gazelles uh, will reduce their metabolic rate up to 50% in the summer. A uh, sand gazelle, uh, which are found in the Sahara, is only 20% of what would be predicted for an animal that size. Another real benefit of reducing the metabolism is that they don't breathe near as often. If you don't breathe near as often, you're not losing water through your breath. All of us lose a tr tremendous amount of water when we breathe. Uh, if you don't believe me, go outside on a cold day. You see that smoke or mist that comes out of your mouth. Well, that's the moisture that's in, on the inside of your lungs it's actually vaporizing as you exhale and, and we continue to exhale water every time. You have to have water present for oxygen exchange to occur to go into a body. Every animal does. So by reducing the metabolic rate, not only are they not producing as much heat, but they're also reducing the amount of water loss. Because those are the two things an animal really has to worry about. Is it going to overheat? reach that critical temperature, which can be lethal, and is it going to lose too much water? And water is hard to get, as you know, in the desert. A lot of animals have evolved behavior that's such that they're nocturnal. They're inactive during the day. Uh, they don't produce as much heat then, uh, lay in the shade, and then come out in the evening, and uh, that can help reduce those heat loads. Um, and because deserts, there's no cloud cover, they cool very rapidly. Um, you may notice that uh, our desert nights are very cold, but if it's a cloudy night, uh, it, it will stay warmer. And that's because those clouds are trapping that heat uh, uh, in the ground close to the earth. If it's a clear night, like most desert nights are, it cools down very quickly. Um, if an animal's body temperature like you and I at 98.6, is cooler than the than their surrounding area, then they'll dump their heat. They'll send their blood to their skin, uh, and the heat will transfer from a warmer body into the cooler air. So they're making conduction actually work for them uh, instead of against them by like sitting on a hot rock. Now, most of us are familiar with evaporation. Most of us are familiar with sweating. Um, the only way an animal can really afford that is if they can afford, if they can avoid dehydration. And you and I can do it. We can go to a water fountain. We can carry an aquafina water bottle. It's not a big problem. It could be if we don't have access to those. It could be lethal if we don't have access to those. Well, no animal that I know have access to a water fountain or an aquafina bottle. So sweating then for animals is kind of a luxury and you only see it really in large animals that can carry a lot of water and mostly from animals of tropical origins uh, where there is a tremendous amount of water. A lot of animals in the desert pant. We'll go over how that helps. Some animals will actually lick their extremities and cool down that way. Now, for small mammals, it's just not an option because they're just not going to get enough water in their lifetime to be able to afford that kind of cooling, so they have to do something else. Let's just look at what you and I need to maintain our body temperature. 
right now this room I'm in and hopefully the room you're in is, is pretty comfortable. It's right, right around 24 degrees centigrade, somewhere around 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. If I quit talking and I just sat here, uh, I would have to sweat just a tiny bit to keep my body temperature from going above 98.6. It will only be about 0.12 liters uh, per hour. If I warm this body, if, if, if I were to warm up this room or you were to warm up your room to 98.6, which is our body temperature, you're gonna need to sweat one to two liters per hour. So think about that. We are producing way more heat than we really need to maintain our body temperature. Our organs, always being active, produce a tremendous amount of heat. So we have to sweat to keep cool if it gets above, if, our, if the ambient temperature, which is what's around us, becomes close to our body temperature. If it becomes above our body temperature, then we really have to sweat. Um, if you are moving around, that could be two to four liters per hour, uh, even, up, uh, even up to five or six, depending on the amount of radiation. Now, I studied desert bighorn sheep for three, uh, almost 10 years. And I, nor anyone who worked for me, could ever leave the truck without carrying a minimum of three gallons of water. You hear the old adage, a human being needs one gallon uh, in the desert to stay. Well, that, that's if you're laying under a Palo Verde tree in the shade doing absolutely nothing. If you're up moving around, our bodies are just not adapted to that. We're of tropical origin, and we're really gonna have to produce a lot of sweat so evaporation can keep us at 98.6. If not, we'll overheat. This graph, again, is, is kind of complicated, but it was based on some, some early work done in the 50s, uh, where some gentlemen actually went around with animals of different sizes and actually walked around in the desert and tried to measure uh, how much water they were losing. Um, and you can see that large animals over 200 and something kilograms, that's close to four or 500 pounds, are not losing as much water as say you and I, uh, we're going to be losing, oh, almost 2% per hour. Um, that's a lot. 10 to 20% of body loss, well, if you lose five to 6% of your body weight in water in a day, you, 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 you may not make it. Um, Look at dogs, you can imagine almost 3% of their body weight per hour. Really important to carry water for them. Then you get into the small animals and they just, and if they were to use evaporation to keep cool, it would just be way off the scale, 20% for a 25 gram animal. 25% per, 20 per hour. 20% is lethal for almost anything. There are just a few animals that we're going to talk about that can lose more than 20% of their body weight. So you can see that small animals, evaporation or even panting is just not an option. They'll lose way too much water. Um, so it's, it's not an option for everything. So again, a little repetition here. Uh, you'll see sweating in primates, large hoof mammals that can carry a lot of water with them, horses, cattle, cattle, large antelopes. Camels can sweat, but they won't when it's dry, and we'll get to that in a minute. Panting, smaller antelopes do this, uh, carnivores do this, birds, uh, we call it gular flutter, but it's the same thing. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, licking the extremities. Now, the advantages of panting is it provides its own airflow, uh, which facilitates evaporation, uh, and saliva does not contain the salt like sweats does, so uh, the animal that pants actually does not lose near as much salt, uh, and you don't use as much you don't use as much water. The disadvantage is it can cause excessive loss of carbon dioxide from lungs if the animal has to breathe too fast, uh, and also the increased workload of breathing. Um, it, it takes energy to breathe, and if you're using it too much, uh, you can start to get a negative caloric uh, value for the day. Now, how does panting work? 
we've got a couple graphs here. The first one shows the Thompson's Gazelle, which is this guy over here. And the Thompson's Gazelle will, uh, at a certain temperature, right around 38 degrees centigrade, which is where most mammals prefer to be, uh, can really slow down the, the body temperature, excuse me, the brain temperature. The body temperature is continuing, 40, 42, 44. The brain temperature is staying very, very close to 40 degrees centigrade. The raven, on the other hand, who can't pant, that brain temperature is going up and up and up to 44 degrees, and unfortunately at that time it's dead. And the way they do that is by, there's a huge arterial flow and a huge capillary bread near and around the brain. So in the nasal passages, in a dog underneath the tongue, um, it begins to cool down all that blood before it goes to the brain. And that will keep that brain cool. And that's the part that all animals, not just you and I, have to keep cool. Your brain can't afford to overheat. Um, so these animals have evolved the ability to allow their body to overheat, but they don't let the brain overheat. So a gazelle, it's hot, the sun is shining, and a cheetah decides to chase it. It doesn't have the ability to say, time out, I'm hot, I haven't had any water, you need to come back later. It's got to run, and it's gonna heat up 43, 45 degrees, 110 degrees Fahrenheit, that body will go up to. It has to keep that brain cool. It's able to do it because it can pant, and it has a, a pretty magnificent capillary bed surrounding the air before it goes to the surrounding the blood is cooled by the air as it goes to the, to the brain. Other animals will use evaporation in some strange ways. This is a picture of a turkey vulture, and they'll actually urinate on their legs. That doesn't sound very appetizing, but it does cool down the blood, and they'll send the blood to the legs while the urine is there and evaporating, and the blood will come back into their body and cool them down. That's shaded. Uh, and again, they're using that evaporation. There's other species that do the same thing. Jackrabbits, um, which are very common here in the desert, and this is uh, uh, some photographs of an antelope jackrabbit, and literally one-third of the surface area of their body is in the ears. Okay, so it's like 33% of their body is in the ears, and it's very narrow. Uh, and so a rabbit is chased by a coyote, very much like the gazelle, doesn't have the ability to say, time out, I got, I got to cool down here. It has to keep running. Uh, and then as soon as it escapes, hopefully it escapes, it'll get to the shade, and then they can literally send 100% of their blood through their ears within an hour. And they will just pump blood through their ears. The ears are in the shade, it cools down, all they've got to do is lose one, two, maybe three degrees. Three degrees is tough. If they can lose one to two degrees that they built up from running, one to two degrees that they built up from being in the sun for a short period of time, that can make the difference between life and death, and it often does. And you can see, if you look on these, on these photos, look at the size of the, of the large arteries and veins, and just imagine literally miles of, uh, not miles, but close to a kilometer or so of capillary beds that, that flow out uh, in the shade through this very thin membrane, cool down, and then that cooled down blood goes back into the body core and cools it down. Here is a, uh, the, a time after the animal has been run, uh, and they, how much they sent, how much their blood they sent to the ears, and then you can see how it cools down um, and, and allows their body to maintain. Now, again, I studied this animal for a long time, so it's one of, it's one of my favorites. This term here, reti marabelli, or ret marabile, however you want to pronounce it, I don't speak French very well, uh, is a huge capillary bed. And this is a U, this is the female. Uh, and you can see that area there, and it's completely shaded. 
we can't see the rams whether it's shade. Now these particular animals will stand there in the desert, in the sun, in front of God and everybody, and the sun just beats down on them. And they will just absorb that radiation as much as possible in their air and their hair as they can. But underneath will always be shaded. Um, and it's kind of a duh. But they have very, very light hair underneath. So their body may heat up to 103, one to 106, okay, Fahrenheit. And they're fine. You and I at 106, we're almost dead. Uh, matter of fact, you better get to the doctor uh, and, and or get into a cool bathtub. For them, that's not a problem. They allow their body temperature to warm up. Underneath, it might only be 100, 101, and that will cause a heat transfer because now it's 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 cooler. They can send all that blood um, to the belly and it's cooling down because the air near the belly is only 100, the blood temperature is 103, and it will drop a degree or two, which helps them make it through that very difficult day. And they do this every day. This is also another animal that uh, we mentioned loss of, of, of body weight. These animals can lose 30% of their body weight in water. So this, if this ewe weighs 100 pounds, she can get down to 70, all of that being water. As long as she finds water about that time, she'll be all right, which is an amazing adaptation. There's so much physiology that goes along with this. Cell structure has to be different. The salt load is higher in the blood. Uh, it, it's very difficult, but uh, these animals do have the ability to do that. And sometimes a desert animal, or an arid animal gets too hot. And so they have insulating layers that somewhat protect them from the sun. But sometimes when they get too hot, underneath the arms and in the legs, very little hair. And again, you have those ret metabot, reti metabili, areas where there's huge capillary beds, it's shaded, and those animals will literally stretch their pits out and cool down uh, by allowing a little bit of evaporation there and cool that blood just enough to help them. And those are called heat windows. Animals also are able to reduce the radiation. Um, this is a Gemsbach and we'll come back to them. This guy here is the star. He is the all-time uh, leader as far as desert adaptations and we'll come back to them. This is a springbok. He's close. Much smaller antelope uh, found in the uh, Namib uh, in, in Africa. Uh, this is one of our own Sonoran pronghorn here in Arizona. Uh, and they, this fur that they have, you'd think they'd want to get rid of it, but it actually helps shade them. Uh, and it's a substantial barrier to that solar radiation. For example, they, they did a study with camels who have very thick hair, uh, and they sheared them. And they lost 50% more water, uh, the sheared camels did, through sweat, than those that, that weren't sheared. Uh, the coat color is important. You often see arid, adapted animals as very tan, light colored, that helps to reflect, uh, excuse me, up to 20% of the light. Now, those are animals that can, can handle it. Most of our desert animals can. And so they have to kind of skip the day. And they just evade it. So they burrow. They dig in the sand. They live in the shade all day and are nocturnal. And some of them even estivate, which is like a miniature hibernation in the heat. So these guys, all are our burrows, we have... Yeah, well, I'll get to that here in a second. But I explained this earlier. Our head height might be 50 degrees centigrade during the day. Down here it could be 70. So, and, and, and here we're talking 140, 150 degrees. I mean, like the temperature of your oven. But these little guys go down these holes, and they go down up to a meter, 
and as they go down the temperature declines so and it shows that here at one and a half meters the range of temperatures from instead of 70 degrees centigrade is now 20 to 25 so like your room temperature um, most of them don't get down that far. Most of them are about here, about 60 centimeters to a meter. They're still at 30 to 35 degrees centigrade, but they are able to cool down enough that they can make it through the day. And then they'll come out at night, they'll dump that heat, they'll cool their body down. It's such a strong, I mean, the, the heat is such a factor on these guys that, and again, I said small mammals can't afford they can't afford to uh, evaporation. So 93% of all our desert mammals are nocturnal. And many of them do what we call estivation, which is kind of like a, a mini hibernation. Now here we have one of ours. This is Amospermophilus lacurus, which is the antelope ground squirrel. You may have seen him. I, I don't see him here on campus, but they're only in the mountains. But hike any of the mountains around here and you're going to see them. You might confuse them with a chipmunk, but chipmunks have lines on their faces. So these are ground squirrels and he's got the little tail there that they use as a parasol. And this is one of the four species uh, that are diurnal in our desert. And the other one here that you'll see in Phoenix is this round tail ground squirrel. Go to the zoo and those things are everywhere. People think they're prairie dogs, but they're, but they're not. And you look at their daily behavior, and in January, they're out all day. It makes sense. Nice day. August, they're out till about 10.30, and then they just shut down. They're skipping that hottest part of the day. It makes very good sense. Well, they can't handle it. These little guys have been recorded with body temperatures up to 112. Remember, it's 106 is about lethal for us. So they have an incredible ability to handle heat, but they're in and out all the time. They're moving constantly, and they constantly have to get back in the shade. If they go out to eat during the daytime, they have to get back in the shade. In and out, in and out, drives you crazy. But they have to avoid that heat. Um, and this is that in and out right here. Boom, 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 boom. All over the place, in and out of the shade, trying to get some food. We're not nocturnal, we gotta eat in the morning, and then we're gonna come out in the afternoon and do the same thing again. Underground. And then many of our species, when they're underground, will shut down, which is, is a lot deeper than what you and I do when we sleep. So they're going through what we call a torpor. It's very, very similar to hibernation. They, they really slow their metabolism down. Uh, and they may stay underneath for six to eight to ten hours. Um, and that makes sense because it, uh, it takes a lot of energy to come out of torpor. So uh, they have to spend a lot. So to make it worthwhile to shut down, they have to stay in a... Because um, the cost of arousal is ten to fifteen times. So most stay six to eight hours, maybe some ten hours. Uh, they'll stay underground and then they will come out of this torpor. They do that by, it's really like a violent shivering. If you've ever seen one of these animals, maybe on a, a TV show or something, and they warm their body up to the shivering and then they're ready to go. And, but of course, they're coming out at night. This guy is not out in the daytime. Let's go back to those animals that, again, there's some, some big horn standing out there in front of God and everybody and they're storing heat. They're just absorbing it. Their body temperature is 101, 102, 103, 104, 105. The insulation changes are important and, and they have the ability to control temperature with or without evaporation, some of them do. If the animal can heat up, if a camel can allow its body temperature to go up to 44 degrees centigrade, which is 111 degrees Fahrenheit, and they can do that, they save a tremendous amount of water. Uh, and so a lot of animals do it. it and also, if you allow your body temperature to go up to 110, 112, now your body temperature is hotter than it is in the shade. It's hotter than the ambient temperature. So if the animal can put itself in the shade, it can actually dump heat outside on a very hot day. 
that you and I don't want to be outside. Now, camels won't do that if they're what? And so here uh, in this graph, and I don't want to spend a lot of time analyzing it, but you can see an animal that's watered will spend a will not store near as much heat and produce quite a bit more from metabolic. A water deprived camel, it's just going to absorb it. It's not going to use it. And they'll save seven liters a day. Almost two gallons. Almost two gallons of water by not sweating. Uh, and they have the ability to do that. Um, so they, they can either evaporate here, cool down, or they can allow for larger swings and they can still survive. Um, and they'll dump that heat at night. This is the Arabian Oryx, uh, daytime temperatures 41, uh, nighttime temperatures 36. And this, uh, we won't go into it here, but this is known as the TNZ, which is the thermal neutral zone, which is the, the range of temperatures those animals can be comfortable at, their body can work well at. You and I are kind of uh, unique among the mammal world. Only the higher primates maintain a one, you know, one temperature. Most animals have a range of temperatures that their body works fine at. If you've got an air to an adapted animal, it's going to have a wide range, not one to two degrees, but six, seven degrees, and they have to. Um, and they're doing everything they can. They're, they're absorbing heat, they're reducing their metabolism, they're trying not to sweat. Um, and so let's look at a group of animals that you're probably somewhat familiar with, and, and that's the Serengeti Plains. Um, you've got animals that are drinking water dependent, the wildebeest and the zebras, and then you've got species like the Dick Dick, the Thompsons and Grant's gazelles, the Stienbach and the Gemsbach, which I showed you a picture of earlier. They're drinking water independent. So how does that affect them? In the Serengeti, the wildebeest and the zebras have to seek shade. They've got to drink water every day or two. No more than two days without water. Because of that, they have to migrate thousands of miles, cross rivers full of crocodiles to ensure they have a steady supply of water. It's costly. Uh, and they cannot drink salty water. Dictics, Stanbach, Gemsbach, they can regulate. Uh, to posture, they do not have to migrate, they can drink water that's the same salt level as ocean, and they can get water from their food. And so here you see the wildebeest during the dry season, they're way up here where there's some water, then as soon as it starts to rain, and usually they leave a day or two beforehand, and then they've got this steady migration, and they're following the rains all the time, they're following the rains. And it's costly, and it's costly energetically, and a lot of predation goes on. Uh, the non-migratory species are always where they were. They don't have to move. So the zebras and the cannot live in areas without free water. Large carnivores to an extent follow them during the migration. But these animals have adapted a very advanced sense of smell. Uh, and again, research now indicates they start moving even before the rain comes. And it costs a lot of energy, and it is a lot of predation, but they're still the two most numerous species. So obviously it's still working for them. Um, the animals that don't have to drink water, don't have to migrate, males can be territorial. They can survive in other areas of Africa that wildebeest and zebras cannot but they're not as numerous because drought has much more of an effect on their reproductive rate. In other words, they don't produce young when it's a really dry year. Let's look at these two gorgeous animals. This is the Gemsbach and this is the Eland. And both of those, very large antelope, this thing about the size of a bison, this is probably five to 600 pounds. And those horns, they can kill lions with them, so can Eland. Elands are over a thousand pounds. Both of them can survive without free water. Now, they did some extensive studies on these guys. Uh, and red is when they are not watered. 
and black is when they are watered. And this is their metabolic rate. And you can see that Elon was able to reduce its metabolic rate a small amount, but the Gemsbach was able to do it quite a bit. So oxygen consumption is the same thing as metabolic rate. So if they do not have water, they really reduce their, their metabolic rate. This is the rise in temperature. You can see that the eland pretty much follows the body temperature even when they're watered or unwatered. However, the Gemsbach allows their body temperature to increase so that it's hotter than the ambient temperature, which is here. Remember what I told you? If, it's, if, if the body temperature is hotter than the ambient temperature, that animal gets in the shade or the shade uh, of the belly, they can dump heat. And that's what this guy is doing. The eland cannot do that. They have to find shade. So Gemsbach are able to survive in areas without trees. Elands are not. Even though they don't have to drink free water, they cannot survive in areas without trees because they can't do that. And the Gemsbach has an unbelievable ability to keep their brain cool. Uh, and this is the rectal temperature going up almost off the scale to 120 degrees. 119 is the highest they've been recorded at and survived. Uh, but they can keep their brain cool. Uh, Elon just can't even come close to that. So the Gemsbach, by many and, and myself included, is considered the, and, and a couple other species, uh, the most adapted large animal uh, to arid and hot conditions. And, and here's just, just a list. Uh, they're drinking water independent, but they can drink free water at the same salt level as the ocean or even saltier and get rid of that salt. Um, there's have some that have been transmitted, radio collar. They haven't drank free water for over 38 months. Uh, many of them live in areas without free water. They have the lowest fecal water and highest osmolarity. Their urine is is about halfway to three quarters of the way towards salt water. They feed nocturnally. They have a remarkable ability to follow tubers, uh, which are greater, which are like large roots, deeper than one meter in the washes. Uh, in fact, the sands people, which they used to call bushmen, uh, the sands people would follow Gemsbach and find these tubers uh, because they couldn't find them themselves. They reduce their metabolic rate by 50%. We've already seen that. Along with the sand gazelle, they have the largest range of internal temperatures, again up to 119. Uh, they don't sweat when water is available, when water, no water is available. Their coat reflects greater than 20% of the, of the radiation, and they reduce the stress of breeding by just skipping it during drought. Some other really cool species. Uh, this is the Namibia beetle. Dune beetle is actually several different species, but um, these guys, the only water that, that is found in the Namib Desert on the coast, on the east, west coast of Africa, is, comes in from the ocean in the, in, the, in, the, in the form of fog. There is no rain. They haven't had rain for five, six years in some of those areas. So when the fog drifts up, these little guys get on the top of the dunes and they will sit right here and they will form the body this shape and the water will condense on their hotter body and it will roll down right into their mouth so, so much so that they can catch up to 34% of their body weight in water in one day or one morning. That's like somebody that weighs 150 pounds drinking nine gallons of water in a day. So they're, they're really good at catching. This is the shovel nose sand lizard that they're, they're kind of uh, having caught a few of them over in the Namib there. They're kind of like Ferraris, they're very, very caught to catch. They will do the same thing. They will get up on the dunes and lick fog droplets off their body. They also have an extra bladder, but it's really not for storing urine, it's storing water. So when, they, when their times are good and they can get a lot of moisture from the fog, uh, they'll build up their water in their bladder so much so that for example, someone who weighs as much as I do would have like a 25 pound bladder and they can hire, they can handle extremely high levels of salt as well. And this is, a, again, this is what some of the desert looks like in the, in the Namib, these apricot dunes. This is a sand grouse 
and uh, they will fly up to 60 kilometers to, uh, they're a ground bird, very much like our quail, fly up to 60 kilometers to get uh, water. Now, their young obviously can't get it when they do that. So what they will do um, is come back to the water and they will dip themselves, and that's what this female is doing right now. She will dip down with those feathers extended and the, the feathers will get all wet, she'll fly back, and their young will actually drink uh, the water off of her feathers. And then last, but not certainly not least, uh, this is the brown hyena. Uh, they don't drink free water. They are related to the spotted hy hyena, but they're quite a bit different. Uh, they don't drink free water, and they eat large quantities of these, what they call Gemsbach cu cucumbers, which Gemsbach do themselves. So what I presented to you is just a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the amount of adaptations um, that desert animals have. But you know the, the differences in ranges of temperatures, the ability to, to pant, the ability to sweat, the, the ability to go without free water. Um, it, it's just odd ad finitum. And, and so hopefully I've sparked a little interest in giving you a, a greater appreciation for the animals that are out there. Uh, and when you're inside and it's 112, those animals are out there and they can't go and get that bottle of Aguafina and they got to make it on their own. So hopefully your appreciation is a little greater and I thank you for listening.